Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at 2 Samuel chapters 21 through 24, especially focusing on that last story. Uh, but these are stories from the reign of David. Uh, as we, The first story that we're going to see is chapter 21, verse 1, uh, David's intercessory prayer in the midst of a famine. A famine takes place uh, in the days of David. Uh, it's a famine that lasts three years. Uh, and uh, David comes to realize, he goes to the Lord, uh, and the Lord says, uh, this is for Saul and his bloody house, because Saul's family had put some Gibeonites to death in, in an unjust manner. And so blood requires blood, and they go before the Lord, uh, and as a result, a number of, of Saul's surviving children now uh, his offspring are taken and put to death, giving blood for blood, sort of to do justice. And the the section ends where David prays. Uh, they bury the bones of Saul and Jonathan. And the last line, uh, chapter 21, verse 14, that God was moved by prayer for the land. And so there's an intercessory prayer. And both the first story and the last story are going to have something very much like this. Well, the second section... Uh, middle of, of chapter 21, we see the accomplishments of a number of what we could call David's giant killers. Uh, and it's, it's just sort of a listing of their feats of bravery and strength. Next, we have in chapter 22, David's song of praise, uh, where he refers to how the Lord is his rock. In fact, that's sort of the, uh, the, the at least the opening words uh, about God has been faithful to rescue. Uh, a wonderful psalm, a wonderful song. Uh, in chapter 23, verses 1 through 7, we have David's words of praise. Uh, it actually starts off. Now, these are the last words of David. Uh, and in that, he makes reference to the everlasting covenant, chapter 23, verse 5. Uh, to uh, his salvation, and uh, by contrast, there's there's the one who loves the Lord and seeks salvation, but there's also the worthless one described in verse verses six and seven, uh, how they must be completely burned with fire uh, in their place. Uh, then next we see the accomplishments of David's mighty men, chapter 23, verses 8 through 39. Uh, and the last story we're going to come to is, again, David's intercessory prayer uh, in the midst of this time a plague. So let's turn there. Chapter 24, verse 1. Now again the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and it incited David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. David's going to do something, but we read of an instance where the anger of the Lord is, is, is there as a part of that decision-making process. Verse 2, the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, go about now throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is as far north as you can go and still be in Israel. Beersheba is as far south as you can go and still be in Israel. And register the people that I may know uh, the number of the people. Verse 3, but Joab said to the king, now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? Joab actually questions the command that he's given from David. And so the, the, the chapter starts off with a reference to the Lord's anger. That's in verse 1. In verse 2, David commands the census. Uh, in verses 3 through 9, Joab actually tries to dissuade David from taking this action. After all, the Lord had said that the people of Israel would be without number. And it's almost as if, I don't know if this is necessarily his plan or his purpose, but it's as if David is trying to count the innumerable. Uh, and Joab tries to talk him out of it, but when he can't do that, Joab goes through with the census. Uh, and in verse 10, we read that David's heart troubled him after he had numbered the people. And now David uh, prays a prayer of repentance. He says, I've seen sin greatly in what I've done, but now, O oh Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I've acted very foolishly. And now Gad, the seer, the, the prophet, uh, comes to David uh, and, and Gad says, okay, there's going to be a result, a punishment, 
and I'm offering you three things. You get to choose, David, uh, one of those. Will it be seven years of famine? Uh, will you flee for three months uh, against your foes? Or will there be three days pestilence in your land? And David's reply is, let the hand of the Lord do this. I don't want it to fall in the hand of the man. This is verse 14. Um, let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, the hand of the Lord. And so the pestilence begins in verse 15. Uh, it comes upon the people and it hasn't gone very far when we read that the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was sent out to stretch his hand toward Jerusalem, um, uh, it's enough, now relax your hand. And David rises up, verse 16, um, the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem, destroy it, the Lord relents. And now, uh, actually it's uh, verses seven, 16 and 17, David speaks to the Lord, verse 17, when he saw the angel was striking down the people and said, behold, it's I that sinned. It is I who've done wrong, but the sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me. Take me instead, David says. And now as he said this, the, the pestilence ceases and Gad comes and tells him to go erect an altar on the place where it stopped. And apparently you could actually note, the, I'm not sure how it was seen, but you could note the place at which the pestilence, the plague had stopped. And it was a threshing floor on the north side of Jerusalem. Uh, to the north of the city. A threshing floor is always a high place. Uh, and this was a high place. It was the threshing floor of Aruna. And so David goes out to, uh, he's going to build an altar and, and Aruna says, well, here, you can take it. You can have it for free. Uh, David had offered to buy it, buy it. And Aruna says, no, you can take it for free. Uh, and David replies, verse 24, the king said to Aruna, uh, Arauna, uh, no, but I will surely buy it for for you from a price, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. Uh, and so he purchases it uh, appropriately. He says, if it's a sacrifice, it's got to be a sacrifice to me. I, I have to pay for it. And there he builds the altar, verse 25, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land and the plague was held back from Israel. And so notice the, the, that, that last line, the Lord was moved. We had we start the story with the Lord being mentioned. We end the story with the Lord being mentioned. Uh, and his anger is moved at the one who offered himself in his place. And of course, the setting there is going to be the place where eventually the, the temple will be constructed. But more than that, in this picture of the king who offers himself, we see a picture of the greater king, the, the, the one that was greater than David, who offered himself. And David had sinned, but the one who offered himself, the greater king, is one who had not sinned. Jesus was without sin, and yet he offered himself for our sins. And God took the sacrifice, accepted that sacrifice, and he did die in our place. Now, of course, he rose again. But in that sacrifice, the Lord was moved. 